but tonight, incidentally, we are, we are on our lessons in Matthew, and we're going to be talking about walking in the blessings of God. Last week, we talked about greatness in the kingdom of God, and we talked about uh, humility, we talked about those things, but before we proceed to chapter 20, there are other items that I will not teach on, but I think I'll just have to discuss it with you, or mention it to you. In chapter 18, especially verses 21 to 35, greatness there is, is demonstrated by, by uh, the ability to receive and to give forgiveness. There are some people who cannot walk in forgiveness. I know, I hope there's nobody here, but there are some people who live bitter lives to the day they die. I mean, they're just bitter. It doesn't matter, or angry. It doesn't matter how blessed they are. They live like that. These are the kind of people that when something wrong happens in their lives, they blame others. Again, uh, I pray to the Lord that none of you will harbor that kind of attitude. But if you, if you keep on just blaming others, that's a, an indication of a bitter life. And so greatness is measured in the scripture by your ability to receive and give forgiveness. Greatness also can be demonstrated by having a tender heart and not a hardened heart towards the word of God. That's in chapter 19, 1 to 12. And then, of course, in chapter 19, 16 to 30, greatness is also shown by what you value the most in your life. That's, that's one thing that you can make self-examinations on. What is it that you value the most in your life? That's where greatness is. You know, some people are, they spend their lives worrying about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, where they're going to live, what are they going to drive. That's the, extent, that's the extent of their life. You know, they work hard, they do everything just on those four areas, what they're going to eat, where they're going to live, what they're going to drive. And that is a very sad life. But there is no greatness there. Greatness is when you, you begin to know that there's a lot of things greater than yourself. In fact, greater than your desires. No matter how, how high or how great you think our desires are, there are higher desires. And it is when you begin to take into consideration those higher desires. That is the desires of God and what is for the good of many. The moment you begin to, uh, to live on those bases, then greatness, the seed of greatness, is beginning to grow in your life. But tonight, having been promised a lot of blessings, let's talk about the subject of walking in the blessings of the Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20, okay? Matthew 20, this is a parable. Now the kingdom of God, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner going out at daybreak, so close to 6 a.m., or around 6 a.m., to hire workers for his vineyard. <coughs> he made an agreement with the workers for one denarius a day and sent them to his vineyard. Going at, at about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You go to my vineyard too, and I will give you a fair wage. So they went now, it's unusual, by the way, for uh, a landowner to go out first thing in the morning, hire workers, and then go out again in the middle of the day. You don't do that. You stay in the, in the, in the vineyard. You supervise the work going on. You don't go multiple times a day to look for a worker. But this is unusual. This is a parable. About the sixth hour, and again at about the ninth hour, he went out and did the same. And then at about the eleventh hour, he went out and found... More men standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? Because no one has hired us, they answered, and said to them, You go into my vineyard too. In the evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his bailiff, Call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with the last arrival and ending with the first, okay? 
So those who were hired at about the 11th hour came forward and received one denarius each. When the first came, when the, when the first came, they expected to get more. But they too received one denarius each. They took it but grumbled at the landowner saying, The man who came last have done only one hour. That is the work. And you have treated them the same as us. Though we have done a heavy day's work in all the least, in all the heat. He answered one of them and said, My friend, I am not being unjust to you. Did we not agree on one denarius? Take your earnings and go. I, chose, I choose to pay the last comer as much as I pay you. But I, have I no right to do what I like with my own? Why should you be envious because I am generous? Thus the last will be first and the first last. Now, once again, Jesus is teaching us through parables. This is the parable of the landowner and his workers. We know, we know right there that it represents God and us, his workers. Because the, the metaphor is about the kingdom of God. Now, this parable, incidentally also, only appeared in the book of Matthew. Matthew is the gospel of the king. The... Parable was taught by Jesus after he said this in chapter 19. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And then he ended this parable by the same statement. Now remember this. The original writings doesn't have chapters and verses. So we only say chapter 20 because it's right before us, chapter 20. But there is no chapter 1 to chapter 20 in Matthew. It's just one big book. Okay? So the real context is, this was given, the parable was given after it was mentioned, the first will be last and the last shall be first. Now, looking at the wider context, this seems to contradict um, what Jesus previously taught in chapter 19. Look at this, chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or land, for the sake of my name, will receive a hundred times as much and also inherit eternal life. Many who are first will be last and the last first. On that, on that uh, teaching, it seems like if you do more, if you leave more, you'll get more. But here, well, you can argue that they left their houses first thing in the morning, the others on the 11th hour. But here, everybody received the same thing. So it seems like, I'm not saying it does, because it doesn't. I, I, but it seems like it contradicts that statement because really we will be rewarded according to our works. And uh, not everybody will have the same reward in heaven. And so if you compare it to heaven, certainly it seems like contradictory. Okay? So the parable talks of the same wages for the first and the last. Same wages. That's the amazing thing. Now, <clears throat> The uh, context in the parable also points to another situation. There are many workers who are without work. Now that is amazing. Many workers who are without work. Not only are there no work, no one would hire them. This is actually common in uh, ancient rabbinic writings. They refer a lot to the uh, interaction between landowners and workers. Because even, for example, in the Philippines, in the third world countries, you can, you can understand that it seems like there is an overflow of workers and less, less job opportunity. You know, America is blessed because, because uh, before the pandemic, we have, we have tons of jobs available. We have no workers. I mean, it's the reverse. We have no workers. We have workers, but they won't do the work because it's a menial task or they don't have the skill. Now, historically, because you have, you have to find some parallels on this. Historically, the Romans, <clears throat> remember here, they refurbished the temple, right? Now, where, where do you get the money in refurbishing the temple? Well, the Romans has to give it. Okay? The Romans has to provide the money. Now, they can... 
they can ask taxes from the citizens, but it has to go through Roman hands because the Romans were the conquering power. Now, the moment it goes through the Roman hands, the Romans will ask the, uh, the priests how much will it cost to refurbish the temple. Say, for example, in today's term, they say, uh, like, like, for example, what's that uh, church that burned? Uh, Notre Dame, right? It burned. It will take how many billions of dollars to refurbish the thing? I think, anybody remember? Nobody. Anybody heard the news? Okay, I hope so. <laughs> but uh, th there was a rich billionaire in, in uh, Europe who immediately promised to give up to $2 billion so that they will refurbish the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Okay? So the same thing happens here. So taxes were collected, collections were made, donations were given. It went to the hands of the Romans. Of course, it was passed on to the priests. Now, there's a big problem that happened. What happened was this. They finished refurbishing the temple. However, for example, if they asked for $1 billion, there was more money in the chest. And the work is done. You see? So now, the priestly clan has a problem. Because the Romans then can come to them and be, a, and be angry and said, you asked for this much money. How come there's a lot more left? Are you this corrupt that you will always charge the Roman government more for less? So they were very scared. There were 18,000 workers that were supposed to be laid off because the, it's almost done. The uh, temple has already been refurbished, minor works, but 18,000 workers are supposed to go home without work. But they have these tons of money left in their building chest. And so the rabbis asked, what are we going to do? And they came up with the solution. They, ah, we will not fire the 18,000. Even if they only work for one hour in one day, they will receive a whole day's wage. Through that, they were able to finish the money. Okay, so I think that is the context by which this parable story was taken from. But there's another story that uh, goes along this line. There was a rabbi who wrote about a work situation wherein the uh, landowner hired some workers in the morning. And what, what, if you have hired people, you will notice that if you don't supervise them, some of them will play around, okay? I remember when we were building that house in, uh, in Lansing, my contractor hired some, some workers, and I know there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but I know at that stage there's less work, but he brought more workers. So I, I developed this habit, I will go down on the basement, and I'll find these two workers, they're playing around, they're not doing anything. So I would go to, to Peter and said, hey, Peter, you have a couple of guys there that are doing nothing. I'm not going to pay them anything. And he got rid of them. Okay? What am I saying? The rabbis wrote about the situation of landowners wherein they will hire you in the first, first thing in the morning and you will relax. Diba yung tawag sa arawan? In arawan. So you will work more, more days and make more money. Hindi pakiyawan. So the, the, uh, the boss was wondering, how come, how come these workers are very slow? So they hired another worker in the afternoon. And this boss found out he doesn't have the intention of paying them the same as the morning workers. But he found out upon production that when he, the, the workers he hired in the afternoon, they accomplished the same way as those hired in the morning. And so the morning workers complain and say, why are you giving us the same amount of wage. And they said, the owner says, because you were slow and you did not do more than the later workers, the later workers. The two of you, the two groups of you actually accomplished the same thing. Certainly we can relate with that. Now remember, life back then is the same as life back here. We have machineries, we have computers, but workers are workers. The laces are the laces still. The hard workers are still hard workers. There, there is nothing you can do about that. 
No matter where you put people who are lazy, they will be lazy. No matter where you put people who are hard workers, they will be hard workers. And so this is the situation. Now, if Jesus is also alluding to this, now it is, now remember, parables are, are uh, earthly stories with heavenly truths. That means if that is the case in the kingdom of God, you want the blessing of the salary, but not all workers are the same. There are some workers who will uh, finish the task. I told you when I was cleaning houses, uh, I, was, I, I was contracted for $20 an hour. The, the house that I was cleaning is, uh, one is two stories, the other one is three stories. But you know, we Filipinos, we, we know how to work. I look at the thing, I said, man, I'm going to work for, for, uh, for five hours to make $100. And I look at the work, I said, this, this rich Americans, the house is not dirty. I mean, the, the, the dirtiest part is the kitchen and putting all the garbage where it belongs. So I said, what, what am I going to do? Because I was, I was estimating, I said, I'll finish this thing between one to two hours. I'll just, phew, I'll inhale, I'll inhale everything, you know. It will be clean. Because I know how fast I can work back then. So I negotiated with the owner then says, let's not say five hours, hundred dollars. I said, I'll finish the job. For hundred dollars, and they agreed. I'm telling you, I'm finishing the job between one to two hours. What is unfortunate for me is the owner of the house doesn't leave the house that day. Boy, I really have to be very slow. <laughs> I mean, because I said this, this, these houses are clean. There's not that much work to do. So I am instead of being paid twenty dollars an hour, I end up being paid something like fifty dollars an hour. You know. But it's because of the contracting. Now, can you imagine if, if you are a worker who will take advantage and you will say, well, I'll slow down. The job that can be done for one to two hours, you will do for five hours. And that is a historical reality even in the times of Jesus. Okay? Not all slaves are hard workers. Some slaves are really lazy. Maybe because they're very tired. So let's, let's uh, apply it to what to what we need to, to, uh, to realize. All of these workers need a blessing. What's the blessing salary? Because they need food on the table. They need to feed their family or support themselves. And all of us here are asking God for blessings. So I'm excited now about uh, our new series on Ephesians. The theme that I will work on is un unpacking or unfolding the blessings of the Lord. There's, there's a lot to, to be learned. I never realized Ephesians has that theme, but I saw it now. So, let's talk about the source of the blessing, okay? We know that God is the source of all blessings. God can use people, God can use employers, God can use government, God can even use your enemies. Like, for example, the two spies who were hidden by Rahab, Okay? Now, Rahab was an unbeliever then. But the blessings of the Lord flow through her. They hid the spies. I remember I used to pray, Lord, use even the vilest offender to bless me. I would, I would pray that way. Because I need the blessings. But we know that God is the source of all blessings. Now, this is something that you and I has to really renew our minds on. It requires faith. Because I will tell you this. Some of you perhaps have already begun to think that your bosses and your job is the source of your blessing. Or some of your children, you think your parents is the source of your blessing. No, they're just instruments that God used. But God is the source of all blessings. The moment you realize that, that God is the source of all blessings, then your dependence is no longer on man, but on God. But we often sleep on depending on men. That's why Psalm 118, 8 and 9 it's very interesting. Now, the workers represents those who are actively in pursuit of the blessings. I think one of the prayers that we often pray is, Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. You know, we, we need something. Lord, bless me. Uh, I have learned a long time ago that uh, as far as my needs are concerned, 
I, I rarely pray for If I need something, I'll just, I'll, I, I need it, you know. I got rid of my old truck. I, I got a new old truck, new old truck because, of course, I don't want to pay for depreciation. You know, I don't even worry about those things. My wife is the one who, who's going crazy about finding a vehicle for me. And she'll be very upset. Why don't I said, ah, let, buy this now, buy this now. I said, no, it's, it's, something will happen. And, 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 and we've got a, a, very, a very good deal. But we are often in search of a blessing. Okay? Now, the moment you are after the blessing and you don't recognize the blesser, it will be a cart pulling the horse. You know? The blessing that the Lord gave Anne and I, we did not look for it. It followed us. And that is Psalm uh, 23. That uh, the goodness of the Lord will follow us all the days of our lives. And there are, there are other blessings that are... My wife and I are very excited because it seems like it is being lined up. And we were not asking for these things. We were not asking for these things. These are blessings that the Lord just decided He will bless us with. Okay, but I'll tell you this: we never pray for these things. We uh, we determine to do the work of the Lord, and the moment you do the work of the Lord, you rest in your faith. God will bless you. The problem is the moment, the moment you begin to think that. By the way, a lot of a lot of our third world immigrants, they really believe that America is the source of blessing. That's why people come here asking for welfare. They, they really believe this is, no, this is not the source of blessing. I'm telling you, I'm not prepared. I was not prepared to pastor here. My plan was to study and then go back home. And the door was, was closed on me. But I was 100% ready to go back home. It, it causes my wife uh, to worry, but, but I was ready to go back 100% until doors were closed on me. I never planned on pastoring a church here, but God opened this kind of door and nobody can close it. And so the blessings of the Lord kept uh, flowing, not on the same measure all the time, but kept on flowing. The temptation that I've learned is this in my mind. The temptation is this. Who is the source of blessing? You know, the pastors or, or anybody for that matter have this problem. We don't pray to God anymore. We pray to fellow human beings. You realize that he has some blessing, so you begin to pray. You know, you know, I'm, you know that he receives some money or some some blessing. So, you know, I'm really I'm really praying that uh, somebody will that that I will receive a hundred dollars because I know he has money. Well, in fact, I'm I'm praying to him. I'm praying to him. That's why we we begin to follow. Our tendency is we follow where the blessing is. That's why most of us came to America. I'll tell you this in, in, in reality. That is why we came to America. There are blessings here, so we follow the blessings. That is reverse. The Bible is very clear. The goodness of God follows us all the days of our life. Where we go, that's where the blessing is. Now, the moment you start following the blessing, you are no longer putting your trust in man, but on, on God, but on the vehicles that God is using. Yeah. The vehicles that God... Don't fall for that. That is something that, that I have to fight early on. But thank God, my, my, the first church where I was officially hired, I have that kind of training. We don't follow uh, the blessing. We follow the blesser. We need to know that character of the source of the blessing from the parable. Number one, he's always looking for workers. This is the human element. He's always looking for workers. Once he finds some, he'll send them to work. He doesn't like seeing lazy people. Or he doesn't like seeing idle people. He, he always gives them something to work. That's why, listen, when you are a Christian and you begin to say, I have nothing to do, what is wrong with you? Because the, owner, the landowner, the owner of the kingdom... It's always looking for workers. But I think our problem is we are, we are forcing ourselves into the situation that already belongs to others. Okay? And so there will be, like, like, look at the argument here in the U.S. 
We need those immigrants because Americans will not do the job. Meaning the job is available. If that is a true statement, the job is available, but some people will never take the job. Now, you have to be very careful. My wife uh, is, is an economist, of course, and a businesswoman, but she doesn't care about what, what she does. Early on in our marriage, she was, she was taking care of old people, I mean, washing old people. We just, both of us, we just don't care because we are not following the blessing. Whatever work is available that can, that can help us do something about our livelihood, we do it. You know, we do it. In fact, I got a scholarship before. Uh, I got a scholarship from the government to study in the only construction school in Illinois. It's in, a, I forgot the place, it's in the suburbs. Yeah, It's run by the unions. And you study for, for nine months. And I chose a contractor's education. Now, the problem is I'm overqualified. Overqualified is just a paper term. Actually, I have no qualification. Well, think about it. They need contractors. Am I a contractor? No, I'm not. Therefore, I'm not qualified. But because I have master's degree, I am overqualified by education. But if you're a contractor building houses, what do you need master's in divinity for? <laughs> Are you going to preach the wood? And the nails line up, you know? No. Therefore, by, by mental block, I am overqualified. But, but in reality, I'm not. So what I did is, have you, have you finished high school? I check yes. Have you finished college? I did not answer. Because you don't have to answer. Yeah. So I was given a scholarship. Yeah. I, I did not go. I was given two scholarships. I was given a scholarship at UTI and at school. UTI. It sounds like a woman's disease or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What is that? This is a school, right? Yeah. What's that? You know, the one that pro auto mechanics. Yeah, I was given a scholarship there also. Now, why is it? Because you believe God provides. Have you, have you, have you heard of uh, a prophet by the name of Elijah? Now, if you are a modern day faith minister, maybe you will ignore the blessing. Why? It's coming from a raven. You know what a raven is? It's unclean. A raven is a scavenger. For a raven to pack on or to claw on the bread, it becomes unclean. And so Elijah could have said, whoa, I like first class service. Well, the people are already starving. It's good that you have bread. Anong palaman? Star margarine? I don't know what, uh, what the spread is. And then, mind you this, he was just drinking from a brook. It's not bottled water or anything like that. But, but here is Elijah, and, and listen to this. Elijah said, I need to be fed. And God says, I will feed you. Because it came from God, he received it. Do you understand this? He received it. He did not complain, I'm a first class prophet. In fact, Lord, all the prophets are cowards. I'm the only one who left is left standing. You need to, to treat me better than, than, than a raven, Lord. And after the brook dried up, and I guess the raven died. Why? Because the raven could not eat the bread. God forbade him. <laughs> so the, the raven was starving, and then this, this prophet was eating. So the raven died, perhaps, and God sent him to a widow, to a widow, from Sarepta, who's dying also. Last measure of flour and last measure of oil. Now he could have said, Lord, come on, have some heart. Bring me to these rich, rich uh, Assyrians or, or rich Babylonians. Let, me, let them welcome me in their house. No, you're asking for bread. This is what I want you to have. And he got it. He did not starve through the pandemic. He did not starve through the famine. Never. But God is the source of blessing. So God will bless you in a way that, that, that He wants. But He's always looking for workers to employ. He is ready to bless them. That is to pay them. That is the analogy. He is ready to pay them. 
and he does not appreciate people. Now listen to this. He does not appreciate people doing nothing. I told you this before. The Lord has never called anybody in the ministry with no work. Everybody has work. Peter was a fisherman. The others were thieves. It's illegal work, but they're still working. The, the others were criminals. They're zealots, you know, rebels. But everybody's working. Elisha was farming. God never called any body lazy yeah the people that God called in the Bible they always have something going on for them Abraham was a successful businessman when God called him Noah was uh, grooming a tribe when God called him all of these people are doing something when God called him he does not appreciate people doing nothing why because there is always something to do we can also see from the parable that the work or the need of the landowner is not the source of the blessing. Meaning the work itself. The landowner has a need. What is his need? He needs workers. His need for workers is not the source of the blessing. It's the landowner. Why? Because there are only workers in the morning. Okay? So, and then he worked on the, on the sec second ship, on the third ship, the fourth ship, until the eleventh hour. No, no landowner will look for workers twice unless it's an emergency. You know, you only work, look once. You go, you go in the morning before you go to uh, Lawrence and uh, Pulaski or Foster and there will be workers sit, uh, standing there. You know, you only do it once and then you send them to work and you go about your business. Nobody goes on the 11th hour. You don't do that. So this, this the need of the landowner is not the source of the blessing. The last worker can say, well, for as long as the, the landowner needs workers, I, I will be... He doesn't need any more worker. He just, don't, he just can't see anybody doing nothing. Tremendous lesson for us in the kingdom of God. If you say you have no ministry, it's not, it's not the, the problem of the landowner. It's your problem. You're not making yourself available. There is always work to be done. Okay? So... Uh, we can also see from the parable that the work or uh, we can also uh, see that the looking for the workers rather is, is somehow modified. Because if there is so much famine in the land and there's an abundance of supply of workers, who look for jobs? The workers, not the employers. If there's an abundance of workers, the workers know exactly where the farms are. And they will go there and say, I need work. That's normally what, even, hey, listen, even during a recession in America or depression, workers go from store to store and company to company. Are you hiring? That's why they start posting outside uh, not hiring, right? Or, or they will post wanted accountant, wanted this. Because they don't like being bothered inside. During times of, of recession, that's what happened because there is an abundance. But these people are just waiting in the marketplace. I don't know what's happening to them. Now, things to learn about walking from these things. These are things to learn, uh, that we need to learn on how to walk in the blessings of God. Number one, you need to be available and you need to be able, in other words, willing, enable, or qualified. Okay? There is a, an old pastor, I don't know if he's still alive, one of my first Sunday school teachers. The name is Pastor Nilo La Pasaran. Uh, the guy is a great, great preacher. He was my Sunday school teacher at Bethel. And he studied at Bethel Bible College. And he told us his testimony. The Lord called him, from, I think from Cebu, to become a pastor. And he graduated from Bethel Bible Institute during that time. And after he graduated, there is no church. There is no church. So he said, I, I finished from the Bible school. I have no church. What am I going to do? They have a farm. And there is a Nipah hut in that farm. So he, he decided, I will go to the Nipah hut and, and wait for the Lord to take me out and pastor a church. I don't know how long, maybe a couple of months, he was, he was in that hut working in the farm. But he said, every Sunday... He will have a service in the Nipahat, Bahay Kubo. He said he will prepare his sermon, 
and with no audience, he will preach. <laughs> and then he said, he said a funny thing. He said, you know what happens in the farm? You have chicken, you have dogs, you have pigs. He said, sometimes chicken will walk in. And he said, I will still continue preaching. He said, after a couple of months, he received a letter. There is a church in the province needing a pastor. He said, I never stopped preaching since I graduated. So I just continued preaching. And he became a pastor of a big church. And then uh, the last thing I heard about him is he was a missionary in Japan. But that is his story. Maybe you have heard of this uh, famous Filipino preacher. Her name is uh, uh, Jared or Nilo Lapasaran Jr., a big guy. That is his son. Okay, that is his son. But, but this is a tremendous guy. But he said, I was preaching every Sunday, preparing my sermon every week, and preaching without an audience. And then the Lord called him to pastor a church. But, but you need to always be able and willing to do the work, meaning your preparation never stops. You, you, don't, you don't practice what you have. You know. Listen, I... I, I have some skills in carpentry. I may be old, but uh, I have some skills in carpentry. I never stop using that. By the way, I never stop studying. I may, I, I may not be, I, I did not go to the Philippines this April. And I don't know, maybe I will not go this, this August also. Probably I'll be there on, on November. But I never stop studying. I never stop uh, uh, learning. I never stop writing. I just keep doing these things. These are, these are habits. Uh, spiritual disciplines that I have developed through the years. I just don't stop. That's why I don't run out of sermons. You need to be willing and able. Second, stop making assumptions about your worth. Now, learn this, okay? Stop making assumptions about your worth. In verse 9, the first workers assume they will get more. He assumed he is worth more. Why? They have assessed their value to the landowner. What is their value? I work here first. Well, some of you don't know the story. When I started here in Chicago, I recommended a pastor. That pastor was an intern of mine in the Philippines. And then, and then he has, he has a, an apartment, great work from the wife. And uh, he's a student, you know, and, and all of these things. Everything is doing great. Not, not like what I went through. He was, he was a legal uh, immigrant right away. So everything is, is doing well for him. Well, the pastor here, uh, from the first years I, I came here, uh, perhaps had mercy on me and, and, and decided to, to let me live in the parsonage where Ate Abilene and Hansel used to live. You know, because they, they bought a house. And so they gave the house to me. If there is a guest, they didn't give it to me. They let me live there. You know? If there is a guest, I host them in that house. I feed them. By the way, the, the unfortunate thing is uh, people will come to church, and if the church is closed, they knock on my door. <laughs> you, know? you know, the daylight, how is it, daylight savings time when, when, you're, when, you lose, when you lose one hour, when you, you think it's 7 o'clock, but actually it's 6 o'clock. That type, we have a so, and then one one lady knock on my door. Pastor, say, don't we have a service? I said it's daylight savings time. So guess what happens to that lady? She has to be in our house for one hour extra. You know, so I don't like I don't like parsonage. I like <laughs> that's when I said I'm not going to live in a parsonage. You know, but I remember my friend get upset because of that, and and he told me that he said you know in America. The youth, the youth pastor is supposed to have the parsonage. You know, I felt, I felt so bad. Because I would love to give him the parsonage. I don't care about the parsonage. But I felt so bad because I was telling myself, you have, you have, you have a wife who is working, good money. You, you, have, you have a school. You are a resident, legal resident in the U.S., and the little that I was blessed with, you want to take it. I, I really felt so bad. I really felt so bad inside. But, but, but you know, I, I, I backed off from, from that. But this, do not, listen to me, do not assume your worth. You know. 
One of the disciplines I have to learn whenever I go to the Philippines, I don't know if I ever learn it, is wearing ID, because everybody has an ID. I don't like wearing ID, I never like wearing ID. But I remember when, when, when I coordinated the Church Growth International Conference of Yonggi Cho in the Philippines, travel all over the Philippines to promote the thing, and I signed over 20,000 letters uh, to invite everybody. And uh, everybody has an ID, so we have the, the uh, table set. And I walk in, boy, I have, I have, uh, I have something like 1,500 people on the wait list. And they are lined up outside of uh, PICC. And so I came in, I was wearing my barong. I don't have my ID, I don't wear ID. And, and there is this pastor, a big pastor, big physically than me, you know. Uh, I was very skinny back then because I wasn't married, you know. Uh, and I was very upset making a scene on the, on the entrance. And I said, sir, can I help you? Who, who where is this? Reverend Jose Nacionales, I said. I need to talk to him because he needs to get me in. I said, why? D did you, did you uh, submit your registration? No, but, but I'm a pastor and this and that. I said, okay, okay. Just, I didn't say I'm Jose Nacionales. You know? And he was very upset with me. So I went in and, you know, when people are doing their work, I don't, I don't interfere. Some people want to take credit even for something that they don't do. I've done my job, so I just walk around. And, and people just call me boss, you know. They call me boss back in those days. Or, or Brother Jose. And then this guy keeps making a scene. And my secretary finally could not take it anymore. I said, okay, I'll let you talk to Pastor Jose. Man, the guy was just screaming at me. So he was rushed in. And said, I'm looking Pastor Jose. And then he introduced, oh, oh you, you, you are Pastor Jose. Sir, can I, can I walk in? I said, no. I said, you wait outside, you know. But he overestimated his worth. You see, listen to me. Do not overestimate your worth. That's bad for you. That is really bad for you. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Yeah. My wife used to tell me when we first pastored this church, because, you know, when we started here, people are always late. And she will tell me, Why are you in a hurry? You're the pastor. You should, they should be waiting on you. I said, wrong. I said, I'm the pastor. I should be there ahead of everybody else. The moment you overestimate your worth, that's what happened. You begin to think that everybody should be waiting for you. I don't have that habit. Yeah, I really don't. And some of you have been with me. The moment I finish my job, I just leave. I don't want to linger around. Hey, what do you say about my sermon? Hey, what do you think? I don't do that. Don't, don't overestimate your worth. You will be subject to flattery. Okay? Do not overestimate your, your, your worth. Why? When they assess their value, they think they can demand. Again, I told you earlier in one of the rabbinic writing, it turned out the, the workers on the first hour, they are lazy. And instead of doing the work, they are relaxed. And maybe they are taking you know, some of this Offices, sad to say, some government workers, they report at nine. The first thing they do is drink coffee for one hour. Have you ever waited in a government office? I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's very irritable sometimes. I, I see some workers and they're chatting, they're flirting, and there are people waiting to be served. You know, I, I, I studied a case written by Harvard University about a uh, post, post office here in Chicago. The subject is post office. One is a pizzeria and a post office in Chicago. At 2 a.m., all the mailmen stop working. At 2, at 2, at 2 p.m. They were, at 2 p.m., they stop. It was a case. I have, I have the study case. And, and, the, and they're being, the, the constituency are, are, are wondering, what is happening to our mail? At 2 p.m., that's the culture. They stop working. I hope they all get born again already. And the reason why the case became public is because a Christian was hired. And a Christian said, I will be doing the right thing. And he refused to stop working at two. And some workers will say, hey, punch me out. If punch out is at four, punch me out. They do that to each other and said, no. You know what happened to that Christian? He got fired. 
because he went against company culture. This is what's happening here. You know, again, when you begin to overestimate your worth, you think the company cannot survive without you. That's a bad attitude to spouse. I think we should be grateful that uh, we have something going for us. Next. Because if you do that, you may end up missing the blessing. Stop assuming God's blessings on your life on the basis of how he blesses others. Jealousy is a dangerous thing. Now, this is what I have done before self-discipline because I told you my car, I have to stop running at 30 minutes or 45 minutes. It, it overheats. And I was very upset. I told the Lord, Lord, I'm serving you. I came to America and have this rotten car. My wife and I call it Kit, you know. Uh, the Ford 323. I mean, it's rotten. And I, we look at some people and say, look, look at those people. I said, they're, they're serving the devil and they have these nice cars. I begin to be very upset inside. Until the Lord rebuked me, you know. So I, I changed my prayer. If I see somebody driving a brand new car, I will be praising God. Lord, thank you for blessing that guy with a brand new car. May he maintain that car. Lord, don't let him lose his job. He can amortize the car. I'll pray all those prayers. And if I see somebody driving a rotten car, I'll say, Lord, please bless that guy. Bless him. Give him a new car. To change my attitude. Yeah. To change my attitude. Because you may end up missing the blessing because of your complaining and, 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 and grumbling. Uh, these are assumptions uh, that we need to get rid of. And then you hear somebody, uh, like for example, one of the joys that I have, we have a member in our church in, uh, in the Philippines, retired as a school teacher, not that much retirement or pension in the Philippines. He's, he's a faith, she's a faithful tither, went to New York, and started taking care of this old, old person. The old person died, I think, after one year or two years. No, because he, he was so nice. She was left an inheritance, because the guy is a, is a millionaire. She was left an inheritance, 200,000 U.S. dollars. A lot more than his, her pension for the rest of her life. The Lord blessed her. I hear stories like that. I rejoice. Remember we had a member here before? I think the, uh, the boss decided to, to give her something like a million dollars. Is it a million dollars, huh? So like, like a million dollars. She was given a million dollars. Boy, I was rejoicing. I didn't realize that the Lord will bless us in a similar fashion. But we never look for it. Yeah, we never look for it. You know, sometimes, you, oh, there's a blessing there. We want to follow that. Maybe I'll have that. No, don't do that. Because you are following the blessing. Do not follow the blessing. In the world, follow the money. Do not follow the money. <laughs> follow the one making the money. Follow the one uh, giving the blessing. And in our case, the blessing is there. You follow the Lord, the blessing is there. You don't have to look for it. You follow the blessing and the Lord is not there, the blessing is not going to be there. Okay? Um, there, there are those, for example, who leave companies and churches thinking that they will close once they... That's our story, Lionside. When uh, we left the church, really some leaders told me this. Oh, pastor will say, the church will close because we are the titans and we are the workers. And I said, no, no, don't say that. I said, because if the Lord... He started the church. The gates of hell is, it will not prevail against it. And the church is still standing today. By, by the way, there, there are some people who left, and that's what they said too. Uh, they said that, oh, oh these are, these are the, the, the faithful leaders, the, the tithers, the church. The church never closed. Because if God started the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do not overestimate your value. The Lord already values you the most. Be happy with it. I'm valuable in the sight of God. You are valuable in the sight of God. Do not overestimate yourself. The next thing is comparing blessings is caused by jealousy and assumption of self-importance. Well, why is it that you have that? Yeah. Why, why is it that you have that? Uh, my, my wife happens to, uh, to be taking care of, of my needs. You know, if, if I have something and, and, my, and my, my kids w want it, I, I give it. I don't know how many times and it happened. She'll be going to, to the Philippines, and some pastor or us, pastor's wife will say, 
Hey, Sister Ann, I like your, your dress. That's what they say. Oh, the following day, my, my wife will give it. Yeah, she, she will just give it. At one time, all, all the best clothes she wore in the mission, she, uh, she gave away. And so when she told me, I said, give it away. I said, well, but, I said but leave something to go home with, okay? <laughs> you can't go home naked. I said, no, no, don't worry about it. Well, the reason why she didn't worry about it is she shopped, yeah. Uh, but but uh, comparing blessings is caused by jealousy and assumption of self-importance. If you see somebody get blessed with a beautiful thing, don't say, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, it's not good for you. Yeah, it's not good for you. I lived in a house in Virginia Beach, and I'll be buying my books because that's my line. I have to buy books. And the one who allowed me to stay in this house saw the books and says, well, you're buying books. He said, I think you need to to give me some money. I said, sure. But what he doesn't know is after I buy the books, I'm almost out of money. I really don't do a lot of things just to buy books. But because he demanded, I said, okay. And I end up looking for my third house. I said, can I stay with you until I graduate? And they said, yes. Yeah. Because sometimes we are, we are, we are being attracted by the blessings of others and and we think they don't deserve it. No, when you see others being blessed, be happy with it. You know, be happy with it. You know, when, when, when I hear in news, somebody get a house, I'm happy with it, you know. You have to be happy with it. Because I'm already sleeping every night, guys. I really don't need any more house. Why God gave us an extra, it's not my problem, it's his. But... Uh, be happy when you see others being blessed. When you are happy, then you are rejoicing with God. Okay? Learn to be content next with what we have while aspiring for more possibilities. You know. While aspiring for more possibilities. There will be stepping stones that God will use. The first the first church that I work in, I was a volunteer children's minister. I was a deacon. I was a Sunday school teacher. All, all without pay for, uh, for a couple of years. And then the promise that I will pass through the church. I did not take any of that. I became an intern instead. Yeah. But, but learn to, to, with what, and, and the Lord has always had people help me. Uh, the first Bible school that I have is very far, Auntie Paul. And then Manila Bell Temple opened their Bible school. I was asked to ask for a scholarship. I did not ask for it. I paid for it. I believed God for it. Not knowing that years later, God will give me the ability to study here. But I never stopped aspiring. I did, not, I did not say, well, I finished Bible school. That's done. No, I did not. I'm telling you, if I am younger today, I would go for my next degree. I would probably take law uh, as my next degree. But I'm old. What, what will I do with that degree? You be content with what you have while aspiring for more. Okay? God blessed you with a car. Be content with that. You can aspire for more. Not, not more cars, but upgrade, you know, an upgrade. Uh, maybe today you are driving a, uh, well, I don't know. You are driving this car, and maybe tomorrow you are driving another car. Maybe it's an upgrade, you know. It's not from a rotten car to a more rotten car. It should be something that, that is aspire for more. You have this job right now, and maybe it's paying you uh, minimum. Be good at it. And then aspire for more. Being content, but aspiring for more. But don't drop things unless you are grasping something else. Because you may... A, a lot of people die because of assumptions. Yeah. Uh, I, we, have, we have heard people, oh, some, some people from other churches talk to me and my wife. 
they are, they are thinking that they will have this, have that. And me and my wife will look at each other and say, man, this person is thinking wrong, you know. And we ask them to prepare for the future, and they never did. Yeah. Uh, be content with what you have while aspiring for more, okay? Your blessings uh, are not signal that you stop working. They are signal instead that you need to keep on thriving. For the blessings are with you. That's why I decided to, the series that I'm doing this Sunday, it's called unfolding. Actually, maybe it's unpacking the blessing. Because I begin to realize, reading and reading Ephesians, that there's a lot more blessing that, by the way, we already have it because we have a deposit. We already have it. Uh, the moment you have the deposit, it doesn't mean you stop. You need the full payment. Okay? You need the full payment. I mean, for, for example, if you sell something, will you give the title and you don't have the full payment? No, you will not have the title. That's why most of us don't have the title of our house. Because the bank will never give us a title unless we have the full payment. It will be foolish for you to give your title when you are not fully paid yet. But even the bank, they will not give you a title. I don't have a title of my house. It's not fully paid. Okay? But the moment it's fully paid, the bank will give me the title. But it's not fully paid, so I don't have the title. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is this. You keep working. Because the blessings of the Lord are unfolding in your life. What you have today may not be that much. But that is a down payment. That is a deposit. You continue to unfold, you continue to unfold, it will continue to unfold to you. You will see more, you will see more. Your problem is when you stop and say, I'm happy with this. The moment you stop, it stops there. Yeah, it stops there. I told you last uh, sun, su Sunday that I was really, in some of my person beginning to say, Lord, are you going to take me home already? I'm, I'm, sometimes you get tired, you know. But you know, seeing my kids grow and, and seeing the progress of some of what we are doing, now I have, I have a renewed desire in my heart to live longer. Yeah. I want to I wanna see the DJ succeed. I want to see uh, my grandkids. Uh, I want to see a school in the Philippines. Now, now there's, there's a lot more unfolding that, that is giving me uh, more passion for, for, for more, for life. What I'm asking God now, Lord, Lord, I'm 58. Do you think you can rush it a little bit? Uh, so, you know, rush it a little bit more. But really, we, God does not offer it. By, by the way, when did God give Abraham a child? When he was 100 years old. You know, none of us here are 100 years old. But at 100, the seed of Abraham was born. At 100, you see. He was called at 65. Anybody here 65? Don't raise your hand. Okay. But... But he was called at 65. I'm, I'm 58. You see. So now the, the Lord is, is uh, I think, working in my heart to desire. Because if, if you keep desiring to die, uh, you will die. The Lord will give it to you. So you need to desire life. But, but don't, don't think the blessings are unfolding before all of us. Okay? Before all of us. So some of you. I mean, I can tell stories after stories on how Members of the church have been blessed by the Lord. But it's not the end. It's unfolding. It will keep on working. What you have today are actually signals that tells you keep on thriving because the blessings are already with you. You know. The blessings are already with you. Keep on thriving. This will ensure success on your endeavors. Don't stop. Do not stop. It will ensure success on your endeavors. God willing and giving me strength, I'll continue studying. Maybe little seminars here and there, specialized seminars here and there. I'll continue doing that. I don't want to be left behind in the field of theology and biblical studies, but I will keep on studying. You know, new things will come out, and thank God I have I have John, and hopefully John will 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 not be selfish, and he will share to me new things that that will be discussed in schools as as you return to school uh, in the future. Because new things, will, you keep updating yourself, then you will not be behind. You know? 
That's how the blessings work. None of us here are living in the fullness of God's word. Nobody. Nobody is living in the fullness of God. All we have are little here and there. Little. I'll show that to you when we study the book of Ephesians. Okay? Amen? Learn something tonight? 